Please take our hymnals and turn to page 168, Mansion Over the Hilltop, page 168. Let's all stand, shall we? Page 168. I'm satisfied with just the God in me. On the second, though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow was torn, and though I find here no permanent Let's go. 
sound good. I don't know why. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You get to heaven because of him. You don't get to heaven because of you. You don't get to heaven because of anybody else. It's him. Notice. But by, Jesus said, but by me. So you have to know Jesus as your Savior. That's why we're here. That's why so many of you sound so good, because you know how you're going. You know, you know it isn't up to you. Could you imagine singing that song and meaning it if getting there was all up to you? How many of you had kind of a rough week? How many of you are honest enough to say, I had kind of a rough week? And how many of you maybe slipped and fell spiritually or you didn't walk in the spirit or boy, you wouldn't be saying, I got them. You'd be going, I hope I have a mansion. <laughs> it's not up to us. It's up to him. So we're here selling break. We're hearing, we're hearing celebrate. We're here celebrating. When you got this oversized brain, sometimes it doesn't work. We're here to. We're here to celebrate that we know that no man cometh unto the Father but by him. I know that. I, it was a thrill to me that I, all I had to do was call on him. And I don't have to go, oh, boy, tomorrow i got to be better. I, gotta, I don't have to be better tomorrow. I just have to trust him. Lord, I'm trusting you. Help me, help me, help me. Pray with me now. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for music and song that song is in our heart and i pray it will be all week i pray that all of us will celebrate what you've done for us and if someone's here and doesn't know that doesn't know it personally i pray they will i ask all that i'm asking in jesus name amen thank you you can be seated page 149 sheltered in the arms of god page 149 
I am. I am. I am sheltered safe within the arms of God. Hope you are. If you have a bulletin, would you grab that? Choir practice, 445 today. 6 o'clock service. Look at the verse, John 2, 17. His disciples remember that it was written, Jesus went in. He saw people in the synagogue that were doing things he didn't want them to do. So he tore the place up. He made a whip. And he drove out those that were there for the wrong reason. The disciples remember that the Bible says, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. He loves his house. He loves the church. He wants, he wants you and I to worship right. He wants us to stay awake when we worship. <laughs> Backside jail on Tuesday. If you would like to be a part of that, you can see Roger Pendle. Wednesday, Lord willing, we'll be here. For our midweek, the Awana meets at 645. The teens meet at 7. We meet at 7. The teens in the youth center and uh, uh, the older teens meet here. Th those over 19. I, 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 I'm, I'm not trying to be unkind. I want to say something about the dinner. If you think I'm unkind, after we're done, you need to run to the bathroom and look in the mirror because we all have issues. Here's my issue. I, I love you. I want to eat with you. This dinner's for us. It's not for the poor. I'm not against feeding the poor. I, I'm, I'm not against soup kitchens. If you want to invite somebody to come, don't invite someone hungry. <laughs> invite someone that you're trying to reach. Okay? We're, we, you say, well, yeah, but I got a friend that likes turkey. Then you should make them a turkey and take them a turkey. Th this sounds very selfish because it is. I want to eat with you. I love your family. I love your friends. But if you have someone that doesn't go to church, that's who you should invite. Okay? I, I might say, they're going to starve. They're not going to starve. I'm just selfish. I want you there. If there's someone you're trying to get to church that doesn't go to church, that might just come to the dinner, ask them. If you've got somebody else that you wanted to come that likes dinners, get them a gift certificate to McDonald's. I, and I'm, I, look, I, 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 you're going to, you, you don't like people. I don't like any of them. Just me. But, you know, if you can spread this rumor, make it a good one. I just, this is our dinner. Hey, when you have Thanksgiving dinner, there's a whole bunch of people that are hungry and that could come. But I love it when my family is at my table. So that's what this is about. This is not about if you come, I want you to come. If you have somebody that you're trying to get in church, trying to witness to, they might come just to the dinner. They are more than welcome. If you invite someone that has a church, we don't want them. Right? We don't want them eating our food. It's our food. And it isn't that I don't like them. This is just our dinner. You say, I don't understand that. There's some things you do I don't understand. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. So I'm just, I'm just telling you, invite people. But invite people that we can influence. I don't want people coming, filling their belly, and then going back to their church.
Let their church feed them. Doesn't mean I don't like them. It means I don't like them eating our food. I don't like them eating my pumpkin pie. If they come, I'll ignore them. We might as well make this good, right? Because you're going to Facebook this. We might as well make it worth reading. Our pastor went off the rails. He hates everybody. He worships pumpkin pie. You'll be close. Pastor, maybe they'll like our food better and switch churches. Well, if you think that, invite them. <laughs> Tell them, I know you go to another church, but if you come to our church and eat, are you willing to switch? <laughs> so you're not coming. That's fine. More food for us. I'm not coming after that remark. You promise? That's for us. Hey, anybody's welcome to our church anytime. Anybody, anybody, anytime. I just don't want it to be that you count this as your family Thanksgiving. Because we're having food. You know what I mean? Is that sound? It sounds rough, I know. I, I'll, let me help you through this. Oh, well. Did you see? Can I just say one thing? And you're not going to like this. It's been a while ago. The guy that Trump appointed to be Attorney General, Matt Gates, he made a comment that it seems like everybody that's anti, uh, that's for abortion is fat and ugly. So they interviewed him, and the, the lady said, uh, uh, Mr. Gates, it sounds like you're saying that everybody that's for abortion is fat and ugly. And he said, did you say that? He said, yeah. Don't you want somebody that's honest? He said, what if they're offended by that? You know what he said? Be offended. That's who I want prosecuting criminals. Just say it. Now look, if, make sure I see this post before you put it in Facebook. <laughs> you know what our pastor said? He hates people. He loves food. He doesn't like it. He wants all the food. You're, you're going to put what you need to put. So the moral of this story is we're having dinner next week. Invite whoever you want. <laughs> Ladies are going to Chicago on the 5th. The 10th, they're having their Christmas party at the Pendles. We are having on the 15th our church Christmas party. That's Sunday evening, and we'll let you know about food. We would like you just be thinking about it. We want to do, you know where you do the cookie exchange? Okay, you, you're mad at me? You're going to get madder. If you bring cookies for a cookie exchange, you got to make them. <laughs> Oreos don't count. Say, so you like Oreos. Yeah, but this is different. See, are you madder? Go look in the mirror as soon as we're done. 25th, Ladies Seminar, Scott, Michigan. That Amy, that sign-up is on the... Hey, we need you to sign up for the dinner, though. We need food. If we do have a bunch of people that ignore what I said and they just start eating all our food, we want to feed everybody. We want to have a good time. And you, look, look at me, look at me, look at me. If you've been to our dinners, you know I don't eat. This is not about food. This is about fellowship. This is about being together. And I just don't want it to turn into, hey, I have somebody, he was fishing, and he knew a guy that is hungry. I, I know. I mean, we'll feed people, but this is our, our dinner. So sign up. We need, I'm sure we need more pie. I'm sure we need more Cool Whip. Ushers are coming. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Hope you don't come next week. I just have this gift, don't I? How to win enemies and influence no one. 
Ready to pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and you like you love us like we are. You don't say change it, I'll love you. You said while we were yet sinners, you did the best thing you could do for us. You sent your son. Thank you. Lord, I pray that we'll love you and, and lighten up and just rejoice and celebrate that we've got a mansion. You, you have done for us what is just unbelievable, but we believe it because you said it. And may we sing that way and live that way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please take our hymnals once again, page 140, where he leads me, page 140. Let's all stand, shall we? On the first verse, junior church, you may be dismissed. seated the brown family is coming to sing
Boy, do I. Boy, do I. 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you could find that, if you have a Bible, we hope you do. 2 Samuel chapter 12, it's all we've got. I've got opinions, but they're not inspired of God. They're inspired of veto, but they're not inspired of God. So we need something inspired of God. So we have his word. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Beth Ann, Roger asked me how Jim was doing. So we'll go to the caregiver. How's Jim doing? Keep praying. Pray hard, pray hard, pray hard. 2 Samuel 12, find that and then I want to not read but kind of walk you through what brings us to this portion of Scripture. Here's the, my title, you'll see this. It's not going to make any sense to you. When you see it, you'll go, oh. Hey, make sure you do that. When we get there, oh. Oh. 2 Samuel 12, David was a fearless warrior. Anyone that went to battle against David, if you ask Goliath if you could raise him from the dead, if you asked him, would you fight that fight again? Goliath would say, sorry, excuse me, ain't no way. Ain't no way. That little pipsqueak, little squirt, Walks out there, doesn't have anything but a little sling, little bag of rocks. That, that, that little, that little good for nothing hit me right in the head with a rock. And then he took my own sword and cut my head off. I wouldn't do that again. They spoke of Saul, King Saul, before David was king. They said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. In other words, David was a better warrior, better soldier than anyone else. Chapter 11 tells us, 2 Samuel, Israel was at war again. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 1, the last sentence says, But David tarried still at Jerusalem. It means he didn't go. He could have, but he didn't. He chose not to. And when he's home, 2 Samuel 11, he's in his palace, which is bigger than anyone else's house. He goes out on his porch and there's a woman, her name is Bathsheba. She is out there doing, it doesn't matter, he sees her. He would have never seen her had he been at battle. He would have never allowed her to catch his eye if he was where he was supposed to to be he calls for her they tell him you want her to come to the palace David said that's right they informed David they said she has a husband I can't believe David said I don't care Bring her to me. They slept together. She got pregnant. David said, I need to take care of this. He gets her husband to leave the battle to come home, to take some R&R. &R. 
And that husband, who at this point, 2 Samuel 11 tells us, had more, more character than David. Uriah says to him, I'm not doing that. David says, no, you, you, need, you need to be with your wife. Don't, does that just kind of make, don't you just want to slap David? He gets Uriah drunk. Uriah still refuses to go with his wife. He's a soldier. That's where he needs to be. And David said, I can't believe you won't spend some time with your wife. David had one reason. He didn't want Uriah to spend time with his wife. He wanted Uriah to, to be the cover-up for his sin. David sends word to Job. He said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to get Uriah as close to the enemy as you can. And when he's so close they can kill him, everybody back up. Wait, 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 wait. This, the Bible says this is the man after God's own heart. That doesn't sound like God's heart. Sounds like David's heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Hey, hey, who can know it? Wow. Job says, I, maybe they were texting. I'm not sure how they did this. Are you sure? Do you realize he'll die? David didn't say, that's just what I want. David said, no, I'm sure. Of course, you know the story. Uriah's up there. They pull away. Uriah dies. He gets a hero's funeral. We come to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We know it's been months, almost a year. The time frame isn't important. Here's what's important. David did not deal with what he did. Are you listening? This will be very harsh and severe on you if you've done something that you don't deal with. The Bible says, if we, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David said, I'm not doing that. Now he's got Bathsheba in his house. She's having his baby. Her husband is dead because David killed him. And David wouldn't deal with it. The Bible tells us, verse 1, God sends Nathan to David's house. Nathan weaves this story he said, you know, there was a rich guy who had all the lambs he could want. And there was a poor guy who had one lamb. And that lamb was special. He treated that lamb like it was his little girl. One day the rich man had a friend come in, called him a traveler, a wayfaring man. He said, when he came into his house, the rich man said, I want to feed my friend. I am not going to take one of my lambs. I'm going to take his only lamb that he treats like a daughter. David can't believe it as he's hearing this story. He can't believe that anyone would do that. You know this story, don't you? 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 5, David's anger was kindled against the man. He didn't know his name, never met him, but it says his anger was kindled against, verse 5, see it? The man. And he said to Nathan, isn't it amazing how we can get emotionally moved? Hey, be honest. Will you be man enough to admit that you've seen something on TV that made you cry? And you knew it wasn't true. 
but you still cried. Hey, remember when old Yeller got shot? Huh? Remember when Nemo got lost? Remember when the toys fell out of the back of the truck at Toy Story? It's all over! Amy will say to me, she, and I hate when she does this, we'll be watching that, because I'm, I'm kind of emotional. And we'll be watching it, and she'd go like this. She'd go, are you crying? No. David's mad. He didn't even know this has happened. He didn't know the rich man or the poor man. He didn't know the wayfaring man. Nathan tells him this story and it says David's anger, verse 5, was greatly kindled. He said, as the Lord liveth, the Lord lives. The Lord's alive. He said, Nathan, because the Lord's living, as the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing, see it, verse 5, shall surely die. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you ever hit a squirrel? Did you look back in your mirror and you saw him flop for a little bit? Then he went to squirrel heaven. Did the cops pull you over and go, you know, you killed that squirrel? <laughs> yeah, it's a squirrel. You're going to die. The death penalty in, you know, Hoopaloopa County is that you die if you kill a squirrel. What do you go, hold on? It's a squirrel. They're all over the place. David's a little out of control, isn't he? It's a lion. It's an animal. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, that man you pointed out twice in verse 5, the man, the man. Nathan said to him in verse 7, David, thou art the man. David knew what he's talking about. Some of us are slicker. We would go, who? Me? Come on, come on. Some of you act like you're angelic and you're not. Did you do that? Oh, I would never. Nathan looks at David in the eye after he tells him that story, and David is still mad. His anger is greatly kindled. He wants the punishment of that man to be death. Surely, he shall surely die. Nathan said, David, thou art the man. Look at verse 7. Thus, there's something in here you've missed. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Look at what God says. Thus saith, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee. God said, I put my reputation on my, I made you king. You, you skip battle, sleep with another man's wife, and then kill him to cover up what you did. Watch, watch. Did God know that would happen? God still anointed him. God doesn't want David to forget who he is, where he is, why he is. Look at verse 7. I anointed thee. Say, no, Samuel anointed him. No, God said, I told Samuel, anoint him. God says, David, I anointed thee king over Israel. Look at verse 7. I love this. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Remember when they're sitting at the table? Saul gets so mad, he picks up a javelin. He throws it at David to kill him, hoping that he would spear him through and through. David runs from that point like a hunted animal. Saul wants nothing else but to kill David. 
You read the account of that. David is slipping in and out. He can see him. He's right by him. He could kill Saul if he wanted, but he doesn't. But Saul never gets the upper hand on David, and David lives. And Saul was more, more intent on it, had more men. And yet God reminds him, verse 7, he said, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. What is God saying there? David, I can take care of you. I rescued you. That wasn't you. Hey, look at me. You, you better figure out, if you have anything good in your life, it's not because of you. God's supposed to get all the glory. Hey, don't tell me good message. It's his book. It's supposed to be a good message. I'm supposed to give it all I got. And then you say, well, I need, yeah, I know, I know you need it. I know you like it because I didn't write it. He did. Amen. Verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 8. He said, I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wife. into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. Stop. God is saying, I can't believe you didn't have enough. I, I can't believe you wanted more. You see it? You're king because I made you king. You're alive because I kept you alive. The house you're in, the wives you have, everything you have, God said, I, that's because of me. Watch this. And if that, verse 8, if that had been too little, what a God we have. If that had been too little, don't miss this word. I would, don't miss it, don't miss it, moreover. Will you look at me a minute? You know what God is about to say to David? You wanted Bathsheba? If you would have came to me, I would have given you more than you wanted. In other words, God is better than Bathsheba. And God is rubbing it in to David. Look at the word. I love this terminology. He said, I would moreover, end of verse 8, I would moreover have given unto thee, look at this, look at this, I love it, such and such. Such and such. You know what that means? That means... Exactly what you thought. Hey, come on, I'm talking to you. I mean, you, you could say, I didn't come to church to get preached at. You, you in the wrong church. There's something you wanted so bad, good or bad, you wanted it, you took it. God is telling him such and such. I could have given you, I could have met that need that you thought you wanted when you took Bathsheba, but you never came to me and let me meet that such and such need. You know why he doesn't name it there? Because it just kind of becomes all-inclusive of whatever you need. He's everything. He at most. He said, I made you king. I delivered you from being killed. I gave you the palace. I gave you all the wife. Can you imagine having that many mates? Hey, you'd always have socks in the drawer. You'd never go, where are my hot pepper socks? I have hot pepper socks. They're my favorite. Say why, don't worry about it. 
Amy, where are my hot pepper socks? You imagine if I had 200 Amy's, I'd have more hot pepper socks than I could wear. God is saying to him, David, I, I have met all your needs. And if there was something you thought you needed that you didn't have, note the word, verse 8, moreover. Say, what does that mean? It means more. Reverse it, moreover, over more. It means God could have given him something better, gooder. I love it when some of you cringe. He could have given him something gooder than Bathsheba. But God said, you never asked. Notice in verse 8, he said, if that had been too little, what I've done for you. Why would God do so much for us? Why would God be willing he said, David, if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee. Such and such is like saying, name it. Name it. When David didn't go to battle, he stood on that roof. He saw Bathsheba. Man, I'd really like to have her. He should have went to his prayer closet, said, God, I, I've got this desire, and it's going to get me in trouble. Would you please meet that need that I think I have? God can. Better people than I have fallen. You know why I haven't? Because I know who can meet my needs. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. Look at verse 14. David confesses in verse 13 that he sinned. In verse 14, look at verse, verse 14, the first verse, how be it. How be it is Nathan saying, well, you know, I'm glad you admit this. But you went way overboard. This is all entailed in how be it. He said, David, you sinned. You didn't care. You killed her husband. And you didn't take care of it for almost a year. I had come say, you need to deal with your sin. Verse 14, how be it? Because by this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. He said, the child also that is born unto thee, notice the words, shall surely die. David said that about the man who took the lamb. Verse 5, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. Pray with me. Lord, I'm asking you to work in us like I can. I want to do what I can, but I know you're real. I know you're alive. I know your Holy Spirit is here either to convict us of something that's wrong or to convict convict us if we're not saved or just to comfort us and encourage us you just do whatever we need you to do I'm asking this in Jesus name amen I would love to see David's face as Nathan tells him this story There was a rich man, had all he needed. Is David's conscience going? That's me. Is his conscience going? Amen. I love conviction. I'm not as dumb as I look. I can see it in your face. You don't have to say anything. You read like an easy book. Run, run. You, you just, sometimes your face is so easy. I'm wondering what David looked like. When Nathan tells him a story that gets him so mad after the loss of a lamb, and yet here's David who took the life, the husband, the future father. David's mad about that. David knew he was worthy of death. 
We know that David wrote Psalm 32, Psalm 51. And the one we don't talk about much, I want to read just a little bit from. After David deals with his sin, God, God reveals to him in Psalm 32. Psalm 51, remember David wrote, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I'm sure when Nathan was talking to David, telling him this story about this poor man and this rich man, I'm sure David didn't look like this. His joy was gone. His conscience was bothering him. Psalm 103, David wrote, we believe after his sin. David writes, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember what God told David? I made you king. I kept you alive. I gave you the palace. I gave you those wives. I've given you everything, and I would have given you anything. David writes, forget not all his benefits. He goes on, who forgiveth, this is Psalm 103, verse 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Verse 5, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He make, made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord, verse 8, Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide. We don't use that word. He will not always chide. It means he won't always be mad. It bothers him when we sin, but he won't deal with us out of his anger. He said, neither will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10 says, Psalm 103, he has not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it. It's gone. The place thereof shall know it no more. But, verse 17, and I'm stopping. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. God doesn't change because of what we do. God doesn't change because of what others say. God doesn't change because of our sin. He stays God. David is feeling this guilt. He's mad about this man who killed this lamb. And then Nathan looks at him and says, David talking about you I'm talking about your sin I'm talking about what you've been hiding and covering you've murdered to cover your sin just took one weak moment one weak moment David becomes this person who no one recognizes he glances at a woman that doesn't belong to him. God reminded him, we read, that God kept him alive. And David needed God. 
But verse 9 says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? He reminds David again of what he's done. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You know what David had to do when he sinned with Bathsheba? He had to throw God's word away and walk on top of it. But God reminds him, such and such, verse 8, such and such. Hey, I have written in the margin of my Bible, Jesus is all we need. Did you ever buy something you thought you needed and then it broke? And then you're mad you bought it and they wouldn't take it back because it's broken. Everybody was saying it, but they wouldn't say to your face, dumbbell. What a dumbbell. That was dumb. And your wife's looking at you and you can hear the words come out of her mouth, but they're not. But she's giving you the look that says, man, you are really a dumbbell. Because she probably said, you don't need that. Don't you hate when they say that? I'm not living for my needs. I'm living for my wants. David didn't need Bathsheba. He wanted Bathsheba. And God comes along through Nathan and says, I'm what you need. And I'm all you could ever want. Such and such. You can live any way you want. You can choose how you live, but how you live reflects on who God is. We make God look bad or good. Nathan reminds David after David gets his heart right and hears his story and realizes that God could have been anything David wanted. Nathan says, hey, by the way, boy, the enemies now are mocking God because of your behavior. And it seems like verse 14 is saying everybody knew about David and his sin and what he did, how he did it, but David. We're so blind to us. At this moment, everybody forgot that David killed Goliath. They're thinking how he killed Uriah. At this moment, they're forgetting about all the times that he went against the Philistines and killed a tens of thousands of the enemy. They're forgetting all about that. What they're remembering is that he killed Uriah. At this moment, they're forgetting all about the time he could have killed Saul because Saul was trying to kill him, and David spared Saul. They forgot all about that. And now all they're thinking about is how he killed Uriah. The Bible tells us in verse Samuel, don't turn there. First Samuel chapter 18, four times, verse 5, verse 14, verse 15, and verse 30. It says, David knew how to behave wisely. That's what makes the sin of a Christian so bad. We know better. I mean, when the world does this, we expect it. When lost people, heathens, whoever they are, unsaved, when they do that, we go, that, hey, you know, dogs bark. Except Milo, but most dogs bark. God's reputation is on the line when he chose David, verse 7. He said, I anointed thee. God said, look, you, you, I, I, you work for me. God sees what David did in verse 9. God sees what David did as a deliberate choice to look down on what God said and side up with evil. Say, preacher, you're making it sound like we should never sin. I'm not trying to make it sound like that. That's exactly what I'm saying. We should never sin. And if you sin, you're not lost. You're just despising what God said. You're just looking down on what he said. You're just siding up with the enemy. You say, when you put it that way, it doesn't sound very desirable. It's not desirable. And according to 
God, God has such and such for you, but you think you need this. And God says, you don't need this. You don't need them. You don't need more of those. You don't need a bigger that. You don't need more money. You need such and such. And God says, by the way, I have it. I have it. Every sin we commit, is an occasion for someone to turn away from God. There's a pastor like me. He had men preach in his pulpit that I would have. He's in jail today, 72 years old, for raping little girls. When I read that story, it, it made me sick because I knew if it could happen to him. Are you with me? It could happen to me. Anytime you despise God's word, you look down on it and then walk on it, you're capable of anything. You read a story like that, you think, how on earth? I, God said, verse 9, how, wherefore hast thou? That's like saying, how, David, you knew. I mean, Dave, look at all this scripture David wrote. David knew scripture. But when you sin, you forget you know it. You don't want to know it. Why? Because it convicts you. I wouldn't want to have to answer to God for giving his enemies an opportunity to not turn to him. In the margin of my Bible, Jesus is all I need. Say, could you sin tomorrow like David did? Yeah. And you know why I, I, I could? Because I forget that Jesus is all I need. And God is saying to David, you forgot. I made you king. I kept you alive. He said, I gave you a house and wives. I gave you Israel and Judah. I trusted you with them, he said, and if that wasn't enough, if that, God uses the word, if that was too little, I would, moreover, aren't you glad that God, listen to me, God is more than you need. So you keep going after stuff that you think will be what you need, and it's not. Why would you keep chasing it? Hey? Why would you keep chasing it? People say to me, Pastor, we have this church. You'd be really good there. I, you don't know that. I need to be where God wants me to be. I mean, I just have to go, you know what? If it's Lakeville, for 37 years, I keep asking God, are you sure it's Lakeville? And God, I hear God say, give it up. Listen to me. It's not about Lakeville. Are you listening? It's about such and such. Not a place, but a person. And the only person that can give me such and such is God. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Lord Jesus, there are people in this room, I can see it in their face. They're not satisfied with what they keep trying to grab. They think they're satisfied because they want to be satisfied, but they're not letting you satisfy them. 
And so they justify, hey, I just want to be satisfied. We need to let you satisfy us. Whatever, we, anything. And your way of saying anything was saying the word moreover. If you want this, I'll give you something that's better than that. Lord, that's what that means. I don't think it means that. That's what it means. Such and such. So anyone in this room and anyone watching can fill in those blanks. Such and such. I don't know how we could say you give us too little, Lord. You told David, you've got, you, you, you're a king, you're alive, you've got wives, house, you've got a kingdom. And if that's too little, I can't believe you said that, God. But I'm going to believe it because you said it. And you're such a great God, you want us to have everything that will satisfy us as long as it's in you. And you're telling David and you're telling us that our satisfaction will only come from you. It didn't come from Bathsheba for David. David thought for sure, get her, I'll be satisfied. He wasn't. He had to kill her husband. He had to live with that. Now the baby dies. Now he has to live with that. He'll be reminded and others will be reminded as they watch him that David should have got his satisfaction that night on his porch when he saw Bathsheba. He should have turned around the moment he saw her. He should have swiveled around, ran inside, knelt at his bed, went in the closet and said, Oh God, oh God, I'm about to do something I know I shouldn't. You deliver me. You delivered me from Saul. Please, God, deliver me from this. Give me, give me what I need. Give me what I want in Christ. Give me what, what only you can give me. Lord, there are people in this room that need to cry that out to you today. They need to find all that they need in you. Such and such. Such and such. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You say, preacher, I don't want to leave here today. I don't want to leave here today until I know that Jesus will satisfy what I want. Because if I don't let him satisfy me, I'll do something that I'll be sorry for. God's speaking to my heart. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Raise them high. Preacher, God's speaking to me. I need to make sure that Jesus is all I need. Not most of what I need, not most of the time, but that Jesus is the only one. Jesus is the only one I'll let meet my needs. I won't let something, I won't let someone, I won't let anything but God because he can. I'm going to trust him for it. I'm going to try that, preacher. I'm going to try that. I'm going to make sure that Jesus is all I need. I'm going to run to him. You didn't raise your hand. Do you want to now? Here's my hand up and down. God, God, preacher, God speak to me. I need to do something about it before I leave here. I want him to be, I want him to prove it. Look, you're not going to believe it because I'm telling you, you're going to believe it because you trust God and God will show you. And that's what God is saying to David. I would moreover have given thee such and such. I've given you all this anyways. And if you thought that was too little, I have more to give you. Trust God for that. Believe God for that. Do it today. If you're here and you're not born again, if you don't know you're going to heaven, we can show you that. We can show you from the Bible how you can know. Not hope, but know. Like you know your name, you can know you're going to heaven. Based upon what God said. Not what we say, what God said. If you don't know that, please do what God said. Let us show you. If you're here when the invitation starts, you say, Preacher, I, I just, I'm uncomfortable coming up there. You'll be more comfortable if you come up here and make a good decision. God will give you something you never thought you could get, and it won't matter where you do it. So would you, when the piano plays and you stand, just leave your seat, make that decision? Heavenly Father, please work. Work in every heart, no matter how young, no matter how old. Work in their heart. Because I pray in Jesus' name. You're standing, piano's playing. As soon as you get up, preacher, I'm going to get satisfied in Jesus. I'm going to let him be all I need. All I need. Maybe something you need to leave at this altar. Maybe something you need to bring up here. Say, God, I've been trying this. It's not working. It's not working. I'm going to leave it up here. 
on the altar. And I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to go back to my seat. I'm going to leave what I thought would give me, give me pleasure. I'm going to leave it up here. Come on, come on, come on. Say, it's hard to get out. It isn't hard to get out. You just don't want to get out. They'll let you out. Just say, hey, I need to get out. Please, please let me through. You squeeze through. Come to this altar. Would you do that? She's playing. Come on, come on. church all the time, read your Bible all the time, pray all the time, witness to people, give your tithe, and you could still not be satisfied. David was one of the best people ever spoken of in the Bible. No one ever else, no one has been said, a a man after God's own heart. No, God never said that about anybody else. And here David blew it big time. Why? Because he didn't get all that he needed, all that he needed from God. You've got to get all you need from God. He's got it. He's got it. He's got it. She's playing the chorus. That's the chorus. Come on. Come on. You say, boy, I, I just, that's so hard. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do what the Lord wants you to do. Don't fuss with him. Just say, okay, I'm coming. Here I come, God. Here I come. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. If you're praying, pray. If you need to come, why I pray, do that, Lord Jesus. We know this. We, we know, we all, many of us saw this scripture and said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so you use David and his failure, his sin. You used him to remind us, I am all you'll ever need or want. God is better than all the Bathshebas in the world. We've got to believe that. We've got to trust him for that. He said it. He promised it. You told David, look, if you would have just asked me, I would have given thee. I gave you everything. I would have given you something better than Bathsheba. I pray we'll know that, Lord. Oh, I pray we'll know that. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.